Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who inspired these words. For the faithful men like Moses who recorded your words, Lord, that we may have them today. And know your will for our lives. Speak to us today through the clouds of confusion and uncertainty and doubt. Clouds of anxiety and fear today. Lord, let us hear your voice. Speak deep within our hearts and our souls. Draw us closer to you. Encourage us. Equip us. Prepare us today, Lord. To live fully into the center of your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Numbers chapter 13 and 14 is this story of the children of Israel who have been delivered out of bondage, bondage in Egypt. This story we call the Exodus. And uh, they've been wandering through the wilderness and they're on the brink of the promised land. They're on the verge of entering into the promised land. And before they do, they're ready and they're prepared and they send spies to scope out the land. And these spies go in and they see that the cities are large and the walls are well fortified. In some places, we know from archaeology that some of these walls would have been 23 to 25 feet thick. Uh, and they scoped out the land was indeed a good land. It's a land that flowed with milk and honey, and it was the land of promise. It was theirs to take. God had promised it to them. Uh, and the spies also saw the people in the land, and they saw that they were strong, and they were fierce and ferocious, and uh, make no mistake about it, uh, they were not nice folks uh, living in peace with one another. They were warring tribes and warring against each other, and the, the land was not settled. It wasn't settled in term, terms of who controlled the land even then. There were always these different tribes and factions fighting each other over control of the land. And uh, Israel's on the brink of, of entering into this promised land, this promise that God had made to them. And uh, they see that some of these people are really, really large. They're big. They look like giants in the land. And they come back to give their report to the rest of the children of Israel, the nation, and uh, Moses. And they're afraid. Their knees are knocking. They're nervous. And they begin to give this report and say, I don't know about this. These folks are strong. Their cities are well fortified. They are large and they are big. And we seem like grasshoppers in their sight. They're too strong for us. That was the majority report. But there was also a minority report. The minority report came from Caleb and, and Joshua was there standing by his side affirming everything that he was saying is that yeah, they might be big, but our God is bigger. Amen. They might be strong, but our God is stronger. And if we go now, we can take this land because God is with us. But the people began to moan and groan and complain and murmur and they formed a committee. You've heard about this committee if you've been around the church for a while. They're on the verge of entering into the promised land and they've got a committee together already. And they're ready to head back somewhere. They're ready to head back to the slavery that God had delivered them from. The slavery where God had done signs and wonders throughout the land of Egypt where He brought judgment on not only the land of Egypt and the rulers of Egypt, but also upon the gods of Egypt. And He showed His mighty hand that He is more than able to deliver His people from bondage. And He even led them through the wilderness to the Red Sea. And when it looked like there was no way... There, God made a way, even through the sea, as He parted the waters and they walked across on dry land. They had experienced all of this, and they had seen the armies of Pharaoh and the chariots of Pharaoh destroyed in the crashing waves as the water came back together. 
Yet here on the verge of entering into the promised land, they once again are afraid. And it's an issue of faith. It's an issue of faith. And they're allowing fear to overcome their faith. Sometimes our obstacles in life, sometimes the challenges of life seem too great. And we sometimes psych ourselves out before we even get started. I remember playing basketball in high school. I made the varsity team in 10th grade. And you think I'm skinny now. Oh my goodness, you should have seen me back then. I weighed about 130 pounds. I was five, nine and a half. I was like a little matchstick kid running around out there on that basketball court. It looked like a chicken with my head cut off. I was pretty quick. <laughs> but I made the varsity basketball team and, and we had a, a pretty, pretty experienced team. We had some seniors on the team, but we didn't have any really big players. Our tallest player was about 6'3". And we at that time didn't have what's called West Stokes now. We only had North Stokes and South Stokes. And they had us playing in what was called the Metro 4A. And little South Stokes was playing schools in Greensboro and Burlington and Winston-Salem. And we had this game when I was in 10th grade against the Winston-Salem City School called Carver. And Carver had some big, big kids. And we knew this going in. In fact, first game we had to play them there at Carver. Whereas our tallest player was about 6'3", their tallest was about 6'8", and they had two kids on that team who went on to play Division I basketball. And we, before we even got, we were, we were defeated before we even got on the bus together. We, we were scared. We were, the chatter was already started. We were just talking about how awesome and how big and how strong these guys were and how overmatched we were. And we got there, and we couldn't even hardly get the ball past, and I sat on the bench most of the time. I was a 10th grader, but we couldn't even get the ball past half court. I mean, it, the, the full court press was on like a pot of neck bones, and we couldn't even get past half court. It was that bad. And, and before the game, it was out of hand by three minutes in. It was, it was done. But we didn't lose the game in those first three minutes. We lost the game laid back at the school at South Stokes before we even got on that bus. We lost the game that day in the school, in the classrooms, because we psyched ourselves out and didn't even give us ourselves a chance. And they slaughtered us. I remember the first play of the game. This kid, John Floyd, one of these guys that went on, he came down the middle of the lane and where that circle is right there in the midst of the foul lane, he jumped from that circle and jumped over a couple of our guys and dumped. <laughs> Holy God. And the coach got desperate enough he put us 10th graders in there. At least we got the ball past half court and could set up with some kind of an offense. But I remember later that night I got home after the game was over. And I was flipping through the channels and the, the four channels we had at the time. And a couple of them were snowy, if you know what I mean. <laughs> we didn't have cable. But uh, on WXI, we had a Winston-Salem on Channel 12, the NBC affiliate, Dan Rath. I'll never forget. Dan Rath, the uh, sports commentator for WXI, said he was calling out the basketball scores. And he says, Carver over South Stokes by four dozen. <laughs> he literally, that's what he said, verbatim. Now I tell you, it's bad when they start counting in the dozens. You know, in basketball. But they totally annihilated us, but they, we were defeated before we even got on the bus. We probably didn't have a chance anyway, but we could have had a better chance. And it was fear that really, really got us. Fear has tore me. Fear is not necessarily a bad thing. Fear is actually a good God-given thing, especially in this fallen world, because it says in the Proverbs that the, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Fear helps us to be cautious. Fear actually helps us to be wise. Fear helps us to stay out of trouble and, and stay on the right path. But fear can be misdirected. It can be directed toward the wrong object. 
And our faith, in other words, can also conversely be directed toward the wrong object. <clears throat> and fear can also paralyze us. When God is calling us to be on the move and get on the move and to move into the center of His will, fear can paralyze us and cause us to want to call, form one of these back to Egypt committees and to retreat. To retreat. And it's the same for the people of God throughout history. All of God's people have been tempted and challenged by fear. Having fear of the wrong things. Having fear of those things that are not God. And having little faith in God. And we always will have to be challenged to face our fears in faith. To face our fears in faith and to trust in the Lord because with God we can never be outnumbered. No matter how little or how light our numbers may be. And with God we can never be overmatched. Because with God, very little is always more than enough. But in order to overcome these fears to keep us from really living into the center of God's will, we have to trust in the Lord. We have to have Him as our ultimate fear. As our fear. To fear the Lord is to respect and to stand in awe of God. Above all. And the other things that we're afraid of show our lack. If we're afraid of other things more than we're afraid of God, it shows our lack of faith in God. And it also reveals where our idols really are. And the, the pattern here that you see here in Numbers is part of a longer story, and it's the pattern, pattern of this Exodus story. And that same pattern of God's salvation of His people out of slavery in Egypt and the, uh, the promise to lead them into this promised land, that whole pattern is the pattern of salvation that underlies all of the New Testament. And it's the same pattern for all of God's people. I preached a couple of sermons recently that, you know, sometimes you may hear that salvation is easy. That salvation by God's grace is easy. But that's not really true. Jesus didn't say that. I've said that in the past, and I've heard a lot of other preachers say that. And a lot of times when I start out with that question, is salvation easy? A lot of times folks say immediately, yeah, yeah, it's easy. But Jesus didn't say that. As a matter of fact, Jesus said salvation is hard. No. He said there is a narrow gate and a narrow way that God calls us to. He calls us to go through this narrow gate and He calls us onto a journey on a narrow way. And He says it's hard. It's a pressurized path. And even though it's a pressurized path, it's, it's not easy. The way that's easy is actually this wide path Jesus talked about. He says that's a path that's easy. And most people head that way. But the path He calls us on is hard. And we're going to be tempted to retreat and tempted to turn back. And I know this will bring up questions. One of the big obstacles to this message today is a teaching that has been in the church for a long time that salvation is easy and that when you believe, it doesn't really matter how you live after that. That it doesn't really matter what you do after you have faith in Jesus Christ. That somehow, that if you believe for one second, or believe just slightly that everything is okay. Sometimes people will say, well, I believe in God. I believe in God. And James says, well, so do the devils. And they're still devils. What kind of faith is that? What kind of faith is it that's really and truly a saving faith? It's a faith that endures. It's a faith that continues. It's a, it's a faith that face, faces challenges and either finds a way to tunnel through or overcome or climb over those obstacles in our way through the power of God, through the grace of God. Jesus says, if you continue in my word, we're oftentimes in life, no matter what the, facing, what the challenge is that we're facing, we're going to be tempted to give up before we even start a lot of times. We're going to be tempted to turn back even before we get going really good. Sometimes. 
And when the temptation comes, we've got to turn to God and realize that no matter how big the obstacles are, God is bigger. And God is better than anything we can retreat to. Amen. So the issue is sometimes people say, well, if I have faith and, and I really believe, uh, are you saying I can lose my salvation? I'm going to tell you that. I don't know. I don't know for sure. Okay. There's different ideas in the church, and it's much more complicated than a lot of people have suspected. But one answer to the question is when somebody, Jesus said, somebody who puts his hand to the plow and turns back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Now one way to answer the question, when it looks like someone has put their faith in Jesus and they started out on this journey with Jesus on this narrow path, when they do turn back, because that happens, one answer to the question is, well, they never really truly had genuine faith to begin with. And that's a possibility. Other possibilities have been put forth is that yeah, they had faith and they lost their faith and they turned back and they headed in the other direction. So either way, but the, 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 either way you look at it, the Bible calls us to an enduring faith, to continue in the faith. Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples and then you shall know the truth and the truth shall do what? Set you free. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Abide in me. Abide, continue, remain. Paul in Colossians 1 there, after talking about how we've been reconciled to Jesus Christ, he says we'll inherit the promises and we'll stand before Jesus Christ as holy and spotless and blameless, but there's an if there. He says if you continue in the faith, not removed from the hope, of the gospel to sin. It's, there's an if there. When we, can, when we start out with God, we need to finish with God. And one of the tr tremendous obstacles to f continuing on this journey with God is going to be fear. Fear. Trusting in the things of the world really and more than God is really what fear is. Fear causes us to flee when we need to take a stand and fight. And to fight the good fight and work our way through the fear. And the root of all fear is not, the root of all fear is, is not, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, let me put it this way. Fear is not the opposite of faith. Fear is not the opposite of faith. Faith or belief, what's the opposite of belief? Unbelief. Unbelief is the root cause of ungodly fear. It causes us to want to flee when we should stand and fight. Unbelief. That's the pattern. You see this in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews actually follows this pattern of the exodus and continually challenges the people of God not to get afraid and not to turn back in the face of the challenges that they faced in their day and time. And he says in there in chapter 3, he moves on into chapter 4, but he says there in chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, take care, brothers. Listen to this now. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil and unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another or encourage one another Every day. There he's talking about this same story in Numbers where this generation, they were on the verge of entering into the promised land and they cowered and they turned back in fear. And God forgave them. On, on the intercession of Moses, God forgave them, but there were still consequences. That generation was not allowed to enter into the promised land and to enter into God's rest. And there in Hebrews, he challenges God's people not to fail to enter into the rest of God's promises and not to fall back in unbelief and fear. So we have to be overcomers. We have to be overcomers, not by our own strength and not by our own power, but by the power of the living God. If you want to turn to Hebrews, if you've got a Bible, let's look at Hebrews this morning, Hebrews chapter 10. He picks up on some of these same promises and these same challenges here. 
And here in Hebrews, he's, he's warning his readers and his hearers not to fall away from the promises of the new covenant and to fall back in here to the old covenant in the ways of the old covenant. To fall back on reliance on the sacrifices that were just a shadow of the greater things to come. He's challenging them not to fall short of the promises of God and not to, to cower in fear because there was going to be a lot of cultural pressure on them. Sometimes from their family members. If they were from a Jewish background, they were going to be tempted and they were going to be challenged and they were going to be uh, coerced into turning back to their old ways of doing things that, that Hebrews assures us have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That He was the once for all ultimate sacrifice for our sins and we don't need any other sacrifice because of that sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And He says in verse 19, He says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and the living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is through His flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with poor water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, listen to this now, this is important. If we're going to overcome fear, we're going to overcome anxiety, there is a huge move today to just make people comfortable with their fears. To call people in their fears. To help them to not really face the challenges of life. A huge movement in the universities especially, they're creating these places that they call safe spaces. Safe spaces. And they'll literally in college classes are these college safe places. They'll bring in coloring books and crayons. Well, I'm not kidding you. They'll bring in teddy bears to comfort and to coddle people. So they don't have to hear anything or don't have to think about anything that may challenge what they already believe and what they already think. This is happening in spades all over the place in America today. In our colleges and our universities. And it's, it's a travesty. Because we don't need to coddle people in their fears. We need to help each other overcome our fears. He says, let us hold fast, verse 23, the confession of faith and hope without wavering. For he, this is the key right here, for he who promised is faithful. And let us, verse 24, this is important, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. We need to encourage one another and challenge one another and help one another and be there for one another to help each other overcome fear. Because fears can be overcome. Fear, our fears that paralyze us don't have to have the final say in our lives. Let me, let me skip down here to, to finish up. He says in verse 35, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, your trust, your faith, which has a great reward. For you have need, listen now, you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Hallelujah. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul shall have, this is God talking, my soul has no pleasure in him. The opposite of faith is unbelief, and unbelief leads to fear, and it causes us to shrink back. It causes us to sit down when we need to stand up. It causes us to stay put when we need to get going. But through the power of God and His faith, we can overcome. But we are not of those who shrink back and destroy, but of those who have faith and so preserve their souls. We need to overcome fear in faith. There was a time in my life where I was as nervous and as anxious as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs all the time, especially around people. 
especially having to speak to people, even to speak to any adult or anybody in authority or to speak to any group of people was absolutely terrifying. When I was a sophomore in college, sophomore in college, I had a class in sociology, which was really a joke in so many ways, and that's another story, but the teacher was high all the time, and that's another story. East Carolina for you. But anyway, she, one of the things that she wanted us to do, which counted for a major test grade, was to get up in front of a hundred or so people and give about a five-minute speech about something. That's all we had to do, a five-minute speech. I could not, would not do it. I could not overcome the anxiety and the fear. I could not do it. I took a zero for a test grade and got a C in a class that I could have easily had an A in. Easily had an A. I mean, that was a joke in the class. I could not do it. I was about 20 years old, thereabouts. Fear can be overcome. When people who know me see what I'm doing today, they can't believe it. Can't believe it. Absolutely. Just, how is this possible? I never would have imagined. And it's not because I'm so good. It's because God is. God is good. And God's not going to always call us to do things that are comfortable to us. Like, you know, when I go to preach still today, I, I still get a little nervous and it still takes a toll on me. I, I'm more introverted by nature. After I, Christy will tell you, Thursday after preaching four days in a row, I was toast Thursday. I mean, I was absolutely toast. But God doesn't call us to be comfortable necessarily. God calls us to go with Him where He wants us to go and to do what He wants us to do for our good, our ultimate good, and for His greater glory. And if God goes with us, and God is with us, then who can stand against us? <clears throat> Isaiah 41.10, He says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. If God be for us, then who can stand against us? No one. Please stand as you're able for our closing hymn today. Trust and obey. Number 467. Trust and obey.